going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. On this episode, I'm going to be giving my reactions to the latest news and rumors going around the NFL. The Jets and Patriots have major locker room drama going on right now. Deshaun Watson is set to miss the remainder of this season for the Browns. We're going to touch on those things and also hit on a couple of other NFL topics as well in this episode. But before we begin... Leave a like, subscribe to the channel. Remember that every episode of the podcast that's uploaded on the channel is available in audio format on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from. You can find the JT Sports Podcast. Give us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. Share the pod with your friends, family members, and acquaintances if you enjoy. Let's start off with this. The New York Jets season is over. A couple of days after they lost to the Raiders on Sunday night football, they had a players only meeting where the players in the locker room came together and voiced their frustrations and grievances. But I felt like this meeting was pretty pointless because the biggest problem with the New York Jets isn't going to get solved. And that's because Robert Sala, for some strange reason, just has this weird commitment to starting Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson is the main reason why the New York Jets locker room is frustrated because he sucks. He's probably the second worst starting quarterback in the NFL right now, not named Tommy DeVito. And you see, there's a reason why Robert Sala and the whole entire Jets front office flew all the way from New York to California to get on their knees to beg for Aaron Rodgers to come play for them. That's because They play in the AFC Conference, which is home to majority of the NFL's best quarterbacks. And if you don't have good or competent quarterback play, it's pretty hard for you to be a playoff team just relying on great defense. And let's face it, Zach Wilson at best is a okay backup. He wouldn't be a starter on the majority of teams in the NFL, and I don't even think he would cut it to be good enough to be a backup on a third of the league right now. You see... These players were frustrated with the quarterback situation last year, which was a big reason why they went out there and they traded for Aaron Rodgers. And there was a lot of hope and optimism coming into this season because of them getting Aaron Rodgers. But when he got injured three plays Monday night against the Buffalo Bills, all that hope and optimism pretty much evaporated. And even though the Jets found the way to win that game, There was reports coming out that said that Jets coaches lost a lot of sleep that night due to the injury to Aaron Rodgers. You see, Zach Wilson, he's holding this team back. And yeah, he's not all of the reason for why this offense sucks, but he deserves 85 to 90% of the blame. The offensive line isn't good. They don't really have any talent at receiver outside of Garrett Wilson. And then they can't run the football. Brees Hall is a great back, but the offensive line isn't good in pass protection or in opening up holes in the run lane. And plus, it doesn't help at the fact that Zach Wilson is so bad that defenses come in and they say, yeah, you're not going to beat us running the football. We're going to force you to beat us with Zach Wilson. And you want to know how Zach Wilson is a terrible quarterback? The fact that he played his best game ever against the Kansas City Chiefs and yet still find the way the fold in the closing minutes of the game and give the Chiefs the win. That's the sign that you don't have a good quarterback. You see, the New York Jets, the fact that Robert Sala keeps throwing Zach Wilson out there and keeps telling everybody there's nobody better that we can throw out there, is bullshit. Robert Sala is either one of three things. Either he's naive, thinking that Zach Wilson one week is just all of a sudden going to figure it all out and he's going to be that quarterback that the Jets envisioned him becoming when they drafted him a couple of years ago out of BYU. Or two, he's delusional because he thinks that Zach Wilson gives them the best chance to win as opposed to the other available quarterbacks out there or the QBs who they could have traded for, such as Joshua Dobbs. Or three, Zach Wilson has him at gunpoint. You guys let me know what you guys think the answer is, but I'm going to go with him being naive and delusional because how can you say Zach Wilson gives you the best chance to win because he knows the playbook and it will take a while for any other quarterback you bring in to get acclimated with the system when the Minnesota Vikings traded for Joshua Dobbs at the trade deadline and then a couple of days later, 
He has to come in against the Atlanta Falcons and he leads them to a win despite having to learn the playbook on the sidelines and not knowing pretty much any of his teammates' name. And they've won two straight games with Joshua Dobbs at the helm at quarterback. So if the Vikings can do it, why can't you do it? Because the New York Jets put all their chips in one basket on Aaron Rodgers. The reason why they hired Nathaniel Hackett was because of his relationship and bond that he had with Aaron Rodgers. You see, Aaron Rodgers came to the New York Jets and this pretty much was the main reason why this team had hope, plus them having a great defense. And if you were like me and you believe that the Jets were good enough to make it to the playoffs because of Aaron Rodgers, it's because you overlooked the offensive line and lack of talent that they had on offense because you felt like Aaron Rodgers was good enough to overcome that. But now that you don't have Aaron Rodgers, you have Zach Wilson back there. This team isn't good enough to carry Zach Wilson on a week-to-week basis. The only way the Jets are going to beat good teams like the Dolphins or the Bills is if they get lucky enough that their defense can play out of this world in those games and force multiple turnovers like they did against the Philadelphia Eagles. You see, they're a worse version of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers, they got bad quarterback play and a bad offensive coordinator. But the difference between them and the Jets is that at times this offense can give you 20 points. And there's enough talent around Kenny Pickett where this offense can have success in certain moments during the game. Meanwhile, you look at the New York Jets looking for this offense to score 17 points in the game. It's like cutting your teeth. You see, Robert Sala, I like him a lot. He's a great motivator. He's obviously a fantastic defense of mine because his defenses have been really good. But for some reason, his inability to just give up and move on from Zach Wilson is hurting this team and it's causing all the frustration that they're dealing with in the locker room. And I'm really surprised that this whole entire team just hasn't flipped on Robert Sala when we know what the main reason is for the New York Jets coming up short. It's the same reason why they didn't make it to the playoffs last year. And even when Aaron Rodgers is ready to come back, I mean, their season is pretty much going to be over before he's even healthy enough to return at quarterback. The only reason Aaron Rodgers probably will be able to play this year, despite the Jets not being in playoff contention, is to give the Jets hope and optimism and a little momentum going into next season. That's all about it. Because there's no way I see them beating either the Bills Dolphins or even the Falcons when their offense is this bad it's hard to win in today's NFL with bad quarterback play the only way you can win with a terrible quarterback like Zach Wilson is if you just have an all-around great roster around him the Jets have a great defense but they don't have a great offensive line they can't run the football in outside of Garrett Wilson who Zach Wilson constantly overthrows even when he's open I mean, there's not too much for him to work with. You see, this player meeting, to me, was pointless. Because the biggest problem with the Jets isn't going to change because Robert Sala refuses to move on from this dude. For some reason, Robert Sala just really wants to give Zach Wilson more time to prove himself. And how much more time does this dude truly deserve? He hasn't proven anything. His best performance against Kansas City, they still lost. He still folded in the closing moments of the game. You see, your franchise quarterback should elevate in big moments, like C.J. Stroud. Zach Wilson in big moments, you're hoping that he just doesn't F it up for you. And you can't win football that way consistently. On a week-to-week basis, you need a consistent, all-around team performance. You got to be able to play complimentary football, and the Jets don't do that. The Jets rely on special teams and great defense to win, and that's about it. That's not a winning formula. You're not going to be able to beat the Bills and the Dolphins with that kind of recipe, and you're damn sure not going to be able to stay afloat in a playoff race when teams like the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals are also on the outside looking in of things. When you look at all of the teams in the AFC, that are currently in the playoff picture right now, they all have good quarterback play. The Jets don't have that. You see, the Steelers, some way, somehow, like, they're able to stay afloat in the playoff chase. But Kenny Pickett is way more serviceable than Zach Wilson. And even then, Deshaun Watson hasn't been great prior to his injury, but he's way better than Zach Wilson. 
So the Steelers and Browns probably are the only two teams in the playoff picture that are finding ways to win despite not having great quarterback play. But you got to take into account that their roster is good enough to help their quarterbacks out. And now that Deshaun Watson's gone, the Browns season may be all but over, but they still got a chance because they got a great defense and they still got an all-around good team. So when you got an all-around good team, you can find ways to overcome bad quarterback play. But you can't overcome bad quarterback play with not a lot of talent to work with and a bad offensive line. And even if Aaron Rodgers is able to come back and this team is somehow able to stay in contention to make it to the playoffs, there's no guarantee that they're even going to be able to get in. At best, they'll be an 8-9 win team. To at least be able to be eligible for the playoffs this year, I believe you got to at least have 10 wins or more. There's a possibility that we may see a team that wins 11 games not even make it into the playoffs with how competitive the AFC has been this year. But, you know, like, it goes back to my earlier point. There was a lot banking on Aaron Rodgers going into this season. And the fact that he's not here and he's not healthy, this team is unraveling. And Zach Wilson getting the nod every single week when he obviously isn't it, it's an indictment on Robert Sala. Because in life, you got to know when to move on from things that just isn't working. And his reluctancy to move on from Zach Wilson just to throw his hands up and say, you know what, we whiffed on Zach Wilson is a large reason why this locker room is having all this frustration. It's not that hard to go out there and get a Joshua Dobbs caliber quarterback out there. Instead of trying to put the best guy on the field to give you the best opportunity to win, you're politicking. You're still throwing Zach Wilson out there because you still want him to live up to the potential that you saw in him when you drafted him. But he obviously doesn't have that much potential. His potential at best is being a good backup. Right now, he's a below average, average at best backup. And although he has been slightly better this season than what he's been in past years, he still is terrible. Like, Zach Wilson and Nathaniel Hackett deserve to be thrown out of the facilities, left on the corner of the road for the dumpster people to come pick them up. Because they're awful. They're trash. Even Nathaniel Hackett, like, his play calling doesn't make Zach Wilson any better. This was an offense tailor-made for Aaron Rodgers. They gave Aaron Rodgers a wish list for crying out loud to make it even more appealing for him to want to come to New York. So you let Aaron Rodgers handpick the players that he wanted to play with and get coached by an offensive coordinator who he loves, but he's not there. So what you expect? The New York Jets, it doesn't matter if Aaron Rodgers gets healthy and he's able to come back this season. Their season is going to be over way before then because Zach Wilson is the main reason why this team is in the situation that they're in. Yeah, if he had a better offensive line, some more talent, he could be slightly better. But even then, they still want to be all that good. Things are getting really ugly down there in New England and really uncomfortable. So I was on Instagram and I read a report that said that 80 to 20 of the New England Patriots locker room has pretty much lost their faith of quarterback Mac Jones. And I'm really surprised that Mac Jones has gotten worse every single season that he's been in the NFL. Like his rookie season, he got voted into the Pro Bowl. And then after that, things have just been going downhill since then. Now it's not all his fault. Bill Belichick fucked up by making Matt Patricia a defensive coordinator, his offensive coordinator in U2, which really didn't help his development. And then going into year three, yeah, you slightly upgrade with Bill O'Brien at the helm calling plays, but he's not all that better than Matt Patricia. Plus, the offensive personnel of Brown Mac Jones just isn't good, but Mac Jones also just isn't a good quarterback. And he's an even more terrible person. The way people talk about Mac Jones, they make it seem like this dude is the damn omen or something like that. And I'm really surprised that Mac Jones has... So many character flaws because I followed Mac Jones' career, not just with him being in the NFL, but all the way dating back to his days playing high school football at Bowles High School. And the reason why I followed his career so extensively is because he comes from the city of Jacksonville and I'm also from Jacksonville. And he played at Bowles High School, which was a powerhouse program in Jacksonville. And at that time, he was getting coached by one of the greatest high school coaches in Florida high school football history. So the fact that 
he can't be coach. He gets really pouty when coaches snap on him. Really has taken me by surprise. And it's no surprise that the locker room doesn't really like him. Because, I mean, when you're nut-checking guys and you're considered to be the dirtiest player in the NFL, like, of course, your teammates probably aren't going to like you neither. You see, it's so bad that there's a rumor that said that last year during a practice after Mac Jones had nut-checked the guy during the game, one of his offensive linemen had pulled him aside and said, hey, fool, you can't be nut-checking people. Because then people are going to want to start trying to do that shit to us. Like, Matt Jones is just a terrible leader. This dude has zero leadership. And even if you're a bad quarterback, you still have to be likable. You see, Kenny Pickett isn't good, but he's well-liked. Deshaun Watson has been a major disappointment for the Cleveland Browns, even when he has been healthy. But the players still really like him, believe it or not. Like, he's one of the more likable quarterbacks in the league, despite what you may think about everything that's going on with him off the field and whatnot. Like, if you ask players about how they feel about Deshaun Watson, they really like him. They really believe in him. You see, it's hard to get the players around you to play at a high level when they don't have a lot of confidence in you. You see, like, the only player on the roster or on the offense that may like Mac Jones is Demario Douglas, and only because he came from Jacksonville, so they probably done played seven on seven with each other in the past and whatnot, and they got that Duval connection, but that's probably the only player on the Patriots roster that actually fucks with Mac Jones, and he's so bad that in the last two minutes against the Indianapolis Colts, after he threw that back-breaking interception that got him cussed out on the sideline by Bill O'Brien, they said, you know what? No, like, we're not throwing you out there for the last two games. We don't, for the last two minutes, we don't trust you. We're going to throw Bailey Zappi out there, our backup quarterback. Bailey Zappi took no snaps during this game prior to the last two minutes. And they was like, you know what, Bailey? Go out there and show us what you can do with the game on the line. And of course, it didn't work. But Mac Jones, like, this dude doesn't have any qualities that shows that he can be a serviceable low-end starter in the National Football League. Outside of that come-from-behind victory that he had against the Buffalo Bills, I mean, there hasn't really been a lot of highlights for Mac Jones in New England in the last two years. And you can say that he hasn't had a great, you know, team around him. But when you're drafted in the first round, you have to be able to overcome certain limitations. You know, like, Bill Belichick, he also deserves a large part of the blame for why Mac Jones is in the situation that he's in now. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you can't be nut checking guys and thinking that people on your team and people around the NFL are going to tolerate that shit. You know, like I've never heard too many crazy things about Mac Jones character until he got to the NFL. Now he had a couple of off the field incidents at Alabama. Like he got arrested for a DUI one time and, at Bowles, like, there were some stories that came out about how he can kind of be a little bit of a loose cannon. But in the NFL, he just seems like a bratty, spoiled brat, pretty much, who can't be coached. And most former first-round picks, even if they are bust and they aren't that good, they normally get multiple opportunities to at least be a backup, like Mr. Trubisky. But if Mac Jones fails in New England, I don't really think he's going to get too many opportunities because he's just not a great character. He's just not somebody that people like. Like, there's a saying in the NFL that goes, your most likable person on the team has to be the backup quarterback because he has to be okay with never getting an opportunity to start unless his number gets called. And he has to call in the plays and do a bunch of other things. You see, I don't think Mac Jones' ego will allow him to do that. You know, and it's like, New England hasn't done him any favors. It's just an all-around effed up situation. You see, Mac Jones was drafted to be Tom Brady's successor. Like Tom Brady, he could be hard on guys. He also could be a little bit feisty with coaching. But he was somebody who the players absolutely believed in. Like, go back and watch their, the America's Team documentary that recapped the Patriots Super Bowl win when they beat the Falcons that season. It didn't matter how much they were down by the Atlanta Falcons. They always had belief because they had 12. And you don't have that same belief in 12 that you do in 10. Because Mac Jones just is a shitty person. And I know it's harsh to say that because I don't really know the dude personally. But I mean, if the teammates aren't fucking with you and the coaching staff has had enough with you, I mean, there has to be something really bad about your character if pretty much the whole franchise has turned their back on you. Like, 
80, it's like 80 to 20% of the team done turned their back on Mac Jones. And it's hard to play good as a quarterback when nobody wants to run through a brick wall for you. The way that the Houston Texans players talk about C.J. Stroud, like, they love this dude. They would run through a brick wall for him. Same thing with Kenny Pickett and Lamar Jackson. Like, you say anything bad about Lamar Jackson, they're probably going to fight you. But with Mac Jones, like, you don't see that. Like, if Mac Jones takes a dirty hit, like, you don't see any teammates getting up in the, the defense of the face about the fight for him. They just don't like him. They don't respect him. And when you have a quarterback that the team doesn't respect, it overall brings down the performance of the offense. Hell, at this point, you might as well start Bailey Zappi and just cut ties with Mac Jones. And Mac Jones is so bad that he pretty much is the reason why Bill Belichick's about to get fired. And it's not just all because Bill Belichick has been incompetent at assembling a solid offense around Mac Jones, but Mac Jones doesn't make the situation any better. This is just a toxic situation all around, but it doesn't help with the fact that Mac Jones is basically acting like the old man. He's acting bratty. He can't be coached. He's barking back with coaches. And, you know, coming out of Bama, like, there were some scouting reports that said that, yeah, like, he can be a little bit hot-headed at times. I kind of ignored that. Because coming from Jacksonville, like, I never heard anything questionable about Mac Jones' character. Like, I've always heard that the dude was a well-mannered kid, came from a great household, had both his parents, even killed, you feel me? And had a really solid season at Alabama. But, you know, Mac Jones, not only did he fool me, but apparently he fooled Bill Belichick and the rest of the Patriots organization. You know, like, I wonder if Mac Jones had Josh McDaniels as his OC for the last two years, and Josh McDaniels never got that head coaching opportunity with the Raiders, if his career would still have went down the same path. Because Josh McDaniels had Mac Jones cooking during his rookie season. Now, although he had a couple of off games, for the most part, like he showed a lot of promise in year one. But now at this point, it's like, oh my goodness, like you gotta get rid of this dude. I'm surprised he hasn't been cut like yesterday. Like he needs to be cut like tomorrow or the next day, with how bad of a person they make it seem like he is. And as I said, like, we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes, and we don't really know Mac Jones personally, but we can only go off what we see on the sidelines and, you know, what we hear from people who are working within an organization, and nobody ever has anything good to say about Mac Jones. Like, I remember last year when he was cussing out um, Matt Patricia. Now, albeit, like, Matt Patricia probably deserved that because... He didn't know what the hell he was doing, but it's like you got a solid OC and Bill O'Brien, somebody who you did have a little bit of a relationship due to your Alabama ties. Like Mac Jones taught Bill O'Brien the playbook when he first got the Bama before he got drafted. So you would have thought that Bill O'Brien would have been able to squeeze a little bit of juice out of Mac Jones, but it's just nothing there. He's not that talented. Like he doesn't have a good arm. His arm is so weak that Bill Belichick didn't even trust this fool to throw a Hail Mary against the Las Vegas Raiders last year. Y'all remember that game? I definitely remember it. So Bill, if Bill Belichick has lost confidence in Mac Jones and the rest of the team has, like at this point, you can't start Mac Jones. You, you got to bench him. And maybe you do what the Raiders did with Derek Carr. You basically may tell him just pack your things and just get out the organization and we'll end up releasing you in a couple of hours or something like that. Let you go find another team that may want to put up with your nonsense. So the fact that the Patriots locker room has turned on Mac Jones makes this thing really uncomfortable if you're Mac Jones. Like, I wouldn't want to be in Mac Jones shoes right now because it has to be a really uncomfortable feeling being the most hated player in your organization and you're the freaking quarterback. Like, there may be players who may just be allowing Mac Jones to get hit on purpose just because they don't like the dude. The Carolina Panthers are the worst team in the NFL. And every day people ask me, JT, how you feel about Bryce Young? Bryce Young is a bust. Listen, I don't believe Bryce Young is a bust. The Carolina Panthers have broken Bryce Young. And, you know, this was a situation I thought was a pretty good one for Bryce Young coming in. You know, many people were pretty high on Frank Wright and the coaching staff that he had assembled. The offensive line played really good last season during the second half of the season. And although the receiving core was much to be desired, like, you didn't think it would be this bad, but this is a terrible situation, an awful situation. And Frank Wright, he's not the same man coach that he was with the Indianapolis Colts. 
Like, Frank Wright is Urban Meyer bad. And that's why Bryce Young is playing some bad football. Like, there are mistakes that Bryce Young is making that I've never, ever seen him make playing for Alabama. And people can make it seem like, well, that's what happens with these Alabama quarterbacks. They never work out in the NFL. Like, no, like, if you actually follow college football and you kept up with Bryce Young's career, you would know that he carried Alabama for the last couple of years that he was starting there. Even ask Nick Saban, like, even Nick Saban would tell you, like, yeah, we were too Bryce Young dependent. That's why Nick Saban got rid of the majority of his coaching staff from the Bryce Young era at Bama and why he has new OCs and a new offensive staff in place this season. You see, like, Bryce Young is being compromised by bad coaching and poor roster management. You see, like, their general manager, they tried to go out there and get receivers at the trade deadline, but apparently they didn't have anything that anybody wanted to give up a Devontae Adams or a Jerry Judy, apparently. And the fact that they gave up DJ Moore in that trade to get Bryce Young makes it really better when you think about this situation. Because Adam Thielen being your best receiver at 30-something years old, not a knock on Adam Thielen, but that's terrible. Their offensive line is terrible too. Like, what do y'all want Bryce Young to do? People keep saying, man, the Panthers should have took CJ Stroud number one overall instead of Bryce. Like, of course they should have did that. And the Heinz said it's, it's easy to say that. And I'm pretty sure that C.J. Stroud, if he was playing with the Panthers right now, he wouldn't be playing at the level that he is with the Texans. The Texans got a really good coaching staff and a better team around C.J. Stroud. Like, people just say, oh, well, he hasn't had a run game or a good offensive line. Neither. Yeah, that is true. But he's throwing to some really good young receivers. Tank Dell can get open. He can create easy separation. I was high on Tank Dell. Okay. And they also got John Mechie. They got a lot of talented young receivers on that roster. The Panthers would love to have them a Tank Dell on their roster right now. I mean, Tank Dell is better than anybody else that they have at receiver outside of Adam Thielen. Bryce Young, with how bad of coaching he's received from Frank Wright and the fact that Frank Wright has just recently retook over play calling duty shows you that everything you need to know about how bad of a situation he's in. You can't expect somebody to turn lemons to lemonade where when they don't even have a stand to even put the lemonade on. To even squeeze the juice out of the lemons to make the lemonade. Like Bryce Young, yes, he's had some really bad performances. He got outplayed in Thursday night football by Tyson Badgett, who was a Division II quarterback around this same time last year. I mean, he had a really bad performance prior to that where he threw multiple interceptions, including a pick six. But when you're in an awful situation, this is the kind of results that you get. You see, I thought that Bryce Young was a generational quarterback. Like, yeah, he doesn't have a great arm. He's not an incredible athlete. But what separated him was his ability to throw for anticipation, have a high football IQ. But the Carolina Panthers haven't done a great job at designing an offense around Bryce Young's strengths. And I know Panthers fans feel really upset that C.J. Stroud is going off with the Texans when the Texans, their guy was Bryce Young. Like when the Texans didn't get the number one overall pick, like they were probably were pissed. They were like, you costed us Bryce Young, Lovey Smith. When in actuality, Lovey Smith actually blessed Houston. Because with Carolina taking Bryce Young, the Houston Texans got blessed with C.J. Stroud, who is a phenomenally of a rookie quarterback. But even if you put C.J. Stroud on Carolina, like, yeah, he'll be better than Bryce Young. But he wouldn't be better than, you know, too much better than what Bryce Young is right now. Like, he wouldn't be putting up the same numbers that he is with the Texans, with the Panthers, with how bad this situation is. Like, your offensive tackles don't forgot how to block. Miles Sanders was one of the worst free agency signings of this past year's free agency cycle. Like, this is just a terrible offense. You got absolutely no talent outside of Adam Thielen. You got terrible coaching from Frank Wright. And that's another thing. Like, I was going back and forth with some fool on Twitter who was trying to say, man, they got to give Frank Wright another year. Like, this dude was a decent coach when he was with the coach. Like, you got to judge people for what they are right now, not for what they used to be or for what you think they could be. That's a problem with a lot of people. Like, we give people more chances than what they should be given because of what we envisioned them becoming, or what we used to view them as. Frank Wright used to be viewed as a solid head coach, but now it's pretty apparent why Indianapolis fired him before the season even concluded. 
This dude's offensive scheme is just terrible, and he just lost it. This dude is like Joe Biden at head coach. Like, sometimes he forgets to call timeouts. Like, Bryce Young has to remind him to do certain things. Like, this is a losing situation for Bryce Young. This is the equivalent to when Trevor Lawrence received Urban Meyer as his head coach's first season in the league. And although Trevor Lawrence is a generational talent, it doesn't matter how good you are, how great of a quarterback prospect you are, if you got to overcome not just the opposing team, but your own coaching staff. Like, Urban Meyer was so bad that Trevor Lawrence got Doug Peterson in year two, and the dude looked tremendously better in his second season. You see, a lot of people who are casual fans of the NFL, like, they just judge a player's success just strictly based on the player, but it's more to players being successful at the quarterback position than just, than just them having a good team around them, or them just being good or bad, like, when it comes to the quarterback position, it's really weird because, yes, how successful a quarterback is depends on their situation and how good of a team they have around them, but it also depends on the coaching. And at the same time, when you get drafted number one overall, you have to be able to overcome dysfunction. But at the same time, you can't overcome just a completely dysfunctional team. You can't overcome a bad offensive line, receivers that can't get open and having no run game. Like, what do you want Bryce Young to do? Like, all of a sudden, this dude needs to become Lamar Jackson, and he also needs to throw the ball and catch it to himself also? He has to play pitch and catch? Like, the Carolina Panthers have broken Bryce Young. You know, like, when I watched Bryce Young at Bama, I saw a dude who always looked poised in big moments. A dude where the moment was never too bright for him. And despite his size, you know, like, a lot of people were really high on him. Even Sean Payton. Sean Payton said that he walked some water. Sean Payton even said that he would have took Bryce Young number one overall if he had the selection. You can go look up Sean Payton on the herd, like really early into the season last year. Like he said, like, yeah, like Bryce Young's one of those prospects that's walks on water. But when you got terrible coaching, it can compromise somebody that looks really promising as a prospect. You see, when you think about quarterbacks that have been bust like Marcus Mariota and Jameis Winston, what do they all have in common? Instability on the coaching staff, not getting great coaching. Bryce Young is, you know, falling victim to that. And it's a shame that people are trying to make it seem like he's a bust and not really giving him the benefit of a doubt that he deserves. Like, yes, we know the dude is small, but you just can't dominate the way that you did at Alabama playing football in the toughest conference in the NFL just because, you know, like, you were small and it was the college game. Like, you got to have some intangibles and some good traits about you to be able to overcome that and be considered somebody who carried Alabama. Like, I get freaking tired of people telling me, oh, he played at Bama. Like, they always got great talent. No, the fuck they didn't. If you watched Alabama, Bryce Young's final season, you would know that those Alabama teams weren't as stacked as what they were in previous years. I get tired of people that do all this damn helmet scouting. Like, shut up. Go watch the film. Go watch the tape. Like, Bryce Young was a really promising prospect coming out, and you can be a really promising prospect that ends up having a pretty awful career because you get compromised getting drafted into a really terrible situation with the terrible head coach. Like, Frank Wright has to go. There's no way you can bring, bring this clown back for another season. No way. Like, this dude's like a female. He doesn't know... How to make up his damn mind. He gave the play calling up a couple of weeks ago. And now he's taking that shit back over. Like, if the dude who you gave the play calling duties to wasn't good. And you weren't good. Then who else is? That's just a sign that you hired a terrible staff. The only good person on the staff that Frank Wright hired was their defense coordinator, Jairo Evero. Like, at least the defense looked solid. Maybe he should take over the reins as the interim head coach for the remainder of the season if they go ahead and just part ways with Frank Wright. Because with how bad this team has been, Frank Wright doesn't deserve to coach the rest of this season. Like, this dude is urban mind your bad. And, you know, I was a big believer in Bryce Young. I still am, but until Frank Wright gets the boot and whoever their general manager is gets the boot, like, Bryce Young is going to continue to struggle. Now, I'm not saying that Bryce Young doesn't deserve any of the blame. You know, like, he definitely has made a lot of bad mistakes, a lot of bad decisions. He kind of holds on to the ball too long, and we aren't really seeing the same playmaking ability 
that we saw at Alabama at this level, but there's only so much you can do when you don't have receivers that can get open consistently outside of 30-something-year-old Adam Thielen. You don't have no run game. You don't have no offensive line. What do you want to do to do? Honestly, like, you tell me. For all the people in the comment section that are calling Bryce Young a bust, how can Bryce Young be comfortable, be serviceable in a situation where receivers can't get open consistently, the offensive line allows him to get pressured as soon as he gets the snap, he has terrible play calling, terrible coaching, like, yes, we understand that when you get drafted first overall and you get drafted this high, you got to be able to overcome terrible situations, but this is a situation where everything is just completely wrong. There's nothing for Bryce Young to go back and look at when he looks at this season and say, yeah, like, has some opportunity to succeed. I mean, the only highlight of his rookie season has been being able to lead the Panthers to a win over C.J. Stroud. That's about it. I mean, at least he was able to outdo C.J. Stroud. Can we give him credit for that? Can we? Because, I mean, you look at C.J. Stroud, you just can't say, oh, well, C.J. Stroud is playing way better than Bryce Young. When they're in two different situations. You see, before the season, many people didn't expect Houston to be a good team. I expected them to be a 7-win team, possibly 8-win team. But now, with Houston actually being a comfortable team or a comfortable team and actually being in the playoff mix, people are going to say, well, the Panthers got it wrong. They should have taken C.J. Stroud. Obviously, C.J. Stroud is the better quarterback. Even if he was playing for the Panthers right now of how bad they've been. He would be better than Bryce Young. I'm not disagreeing with that. But what I am saying is that he want to be putting up the same numbers that he is with the Texans if he was starting for the Panthers. That's just the reality of the situation. And when you look at C.J. Stroud, he got drafted to a team that has nailed all their draft picks. This is a team that traded away Deshaun Watson, and now you look back on that trade, they fleeced them. So whoever is in charge of assembling the roster for the Houston Texans. They've done a great job at killing it in the draft and building a good team around C.J. Stroud that's going to allow him to have success, even with them having limitations, not having a good run game, and not having a good offensive line. At least he has receivers that can get open. I mean, like, bro, Bryce Young doesn't have anything but old man Adam Thielen. That's it. You can't run the football. Receivers can't create separation. Nobody can block for the brother. and. I mean, what what do you want them to do? Honestly, like the Panthers have broken Bryce Young. That's the only, that's the truth about the situation. You can call him a bust anything you want to, but it's not all on him. The majority of this is due to poor drafting. Like, let me ask y'all something. If you're a Panthers fan, what are your most successful draft selections in the last couple of years on offense? Because you know, you've done pretty well on defense. Derrick Brown, J.C. Horn is still pretty solid when he's healthy. Jeremy Chen. But what are the last couple of draft picks on offense that have worked out successfully for Carolina? Akim Kwanu, he's having a really disappointing sophomore campaign. Okay, Chuba Hubbard is like, he's decent, but he's nothing great. Terrence Marshall, he can barely even get the ball. Your best draft picks in the last couple of years has probably been like D.J. Moore. And that's about it. And you traded him away for Bryce Young. And I know that's bitter. You know, it's bittersweet that to get Bryce Young, you have to give up DJ Moore. But that's just the price that it costs to get the number one pick and get a franchise quarterback. You know, like, to have a franchise quarterback, you still have to give them a serviceable situation. Bryce Young can't even get that. I mean, at least give him some receivers. You give Bryce Young some receivers, he looks way different. Outside of Adam Thielen, there's no good receivers. And you can argue that C.J. Stroud would be better, but the Panthers still would be a shit team because they just got bad coaching and a bad team around Bryce Young. You can only overcome so many hindrances. Like, I don't think Bryce Young is a bust. I just think that he got drafted to a situation that we perceive to be a great situation where the Carolina Panthers were just fool's gold. And my guy, the big cat, keep pounding podcasts. Make sure you go check him out. Shout out to him. He told me, honestly, before the season started in the offseason that the Panthers weren't going to be that good. And it shocked me. And he said, yeah, JT, like, Bryce Young doesn't have a good situation. Like, he was questionable about the receivers, didn't really like the offensive line, didn't really trust the coaching staff, and didn't really trust the running backs neither. So props off to my guy, the big cat. But even then, I don't even think he expected for the offense to be as bad as what it's been. Hell, I was talking to a former NFL scout. He told me that CJ Stroud was going to have a better rookie season. 
And, you know, even he said that the Carolina Panthers were a shitty situation, but even he didn't expect for this team to be as bad as what they are right now for Bryce Young to be this compromised. Like, Bryce Young is in an awful situation. The Panthers have broken this young man. And until they get in a new head coach that can instill life into this offense and a GM that's competent enough to build a solid team around Bryce Young for him to have success, like, he's going to continue to look like a bust until otherwise. This is just what happens when you don't have a good situation. Yes, you got to be able to overcome not having it all. That's what comes with being a number one overall pick. But at the same time, like when you just have nothing to work with but an old man, Adam Thielen, there's only so much you can do. Before we move on to our other segments, if you haven't already, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you check out the JT Sports Podcast. We are available on all podcasting platforms. Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from, you can find the JT Sports Podcast. If you are enjoying this episode, please give us a five-star review. Helps the podcast out a lot. Easy way to support us, and it costs no money to do so. Man, are you tired of looking at your stale, boring-ass room? You want to know a way you can spice your room up and turn that thing into an out-of-this-galaxy experience? Click the link in the description or pinned comment and grab you a Starry Projector Light. The Starry Projector Light comes with 10 changeable color options, a built-in Bluetooth speaker, 12 and 15 switchable constellations, planets, moons, and stars. Transform your room from a depressing wasteland into a vibrant starry wonderland. The Starry Projector Light makes for a great holiday gift for family, friends, and loved ones. Click the link in the description or pinned comment and get one today and transform your room into a breathtaking starry wonderland. The Atlanta Falcons have been a major disappointment this season offensively. They've drafted skilled position players in the first round of their last couple of drafts, and for some strange reason, they just have a hard time of finding ways to get those guys to football. B. John Robinson had a really nice performance against Arizona. This was one of the first games in a very long time where he was actually featured in the offense. And then you got Kyle Pitts and Drake London. Like, they can't even get a lot of action either. And they were former first-round picks also. And Arthur Smith is labeled as an offensive-minded coach. But for some reason, this offense under him, since he's been the head coach of Atlanta, hasn't really been all that great. Now, according to a report that I came across, Arthur Smith is expected to return as the Falcons head coach in 2024. The ownership really likes him. He has their backing. He has their blessing. So unless something just catastrophic happens, we're going to see Arthur Smith back on the sidelines come August or September next season. And I don't think Arthur Smith is a shitty head coach, but I don't think he's a good one. I definitely think there are better replacements out there. And the main reason why Arthur Smith shouldn't be a head coach is because he whiffed on the quarterback situation. I mean, at the end of the day, he was still the guy who green-lighted the decision to sign Marcus Mariota. He fizzled out. And then you drive Desmond Ritter in the third round, and he doesn't really have all that much promise. At best, Desmond Ritter can be a low-end starter. He isn't a guy who's going to be able to lead the Atlanta Falcons to a potential Super Bowl. And the thing with Arthur Smith now is that if you're going to give this guy another year to prove himself, you know, you need to go out there and actually get a quarterback if you're Arthur Smith. And if you go out there and you trade for Justin Fields, I honestly don't think that would be too bad of a, de of a decision. Justin Fields, like, I know this dude has had an up and down career where you're kind of banking on the potential and he's had some flashes and some really good games at times. But for the most part, he hasn't really shown the ability to have what it takes to be a franchise quarterback. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Hasn't really had a great team around him until this season. And then he gets injured. And even then, you know, he's still pretty inconsistent. But going to Atlanta would allow Arthur Smith to have a chance to rehabilitate a quarterback that has way more talent than Taylor Heineke and Desmond Ritter. And plus, you look at the weapons that Justin Fields will be able to throw the football to. Drake London, Kyle Pitts, John New Smith, you got B. John Robinson, Tyler Algier in the backfield, and plus, with his running ability, he would be a perfect fit in Arthur Smith offense. You can run read options, design quarterback runs. The thing with Justin Fields is that he doesn't read the field all that great. 
But I was listening to a podcast with RG3 and Cam Newton where they said that the problem with Justin Fields is that the Bears are asking him to do way too much. He's a quarterback where you got to kind of make things easy for him. You got to make things simple. You got to say, hey, you either look at this guy for your first read. If he's not open, look to see if this guy is open on your second read. And if that guy isn't open, then you just decide to just tuck and run. You got to make things simple, stupid for a guy like Justin Fields. And I think Arthur Smith is capable of being able to do that. And even if you don't agree with the decision to go out there and get Justin Fields, you at least got to try to get an upgrade at the quarterback position, at least somebody who's proven to be a uh, you know, mid-range or high-end starter, you don't need to go ahead and break the bank, but you at least got to be able to find you somebody who's like on the Kirk Cousins kind of level. But what's really out there for the Falcons to really improve their QB situation right now? You see, that's the main reason why the Falcons are in the situation that they're in, because they don't really have a quarterback who they can trust in late-game situations. Like, Arthur Smith is a run heavy head coach he wants to put a lot of emphasis on running the football and that's cool but in the year 2023 regardless of what people want to tell you yes you do have to be able to run the football at times but it's still a passing league it's not the 80s or 90s anymore where you just play smash mouth football you run the football 40 50 times a game and you only need your quarterback to throw the ball 10 15 times to win like it's 2023 if you can't trust your quarterback to win a game for you throwing the football, then he shouldn't be your starting quarterback. If your philosophy is we don't need our quarterback to do that much, we just need him to take care of the football, you don't got a good quarterback or at least a quarterback that you can believe in. And I don't get why these head coaches like Arthur Smith put their trust into journeyman backups or journeyman veterans like Marcus Mariota that have been around the block, haven't been able to stick with one team, they've been backups for the previous teams that they played with, and then all of a sudden, you want to put your job security on the line for somebody who hasn't proven to be a competent starter? That makes zero sense to me. And their general manager, Terry Fontenot, like, maybe he returns in 2024? I don't know, but Arthur Smith coming back in 2024 next season, like, I don't think it's a terrible decision, but I don't think it's a great one either. I mean, if you can go out there and get you a new head coach like the offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson, for the Lions, I think he would be a good upgrade over Arthur Smith because maybe he would be able to find ways to get the quarterback situation figured out and get the ball to the guys that you've invested first-round picks in at the skill position. You know, last year, people were saying that the defense was the problem. Well, the defense has been pretty solid this year, but the offense hasn't held their end of the bargain. And you can make all the excuses for him not having a quarterback that he needs, but he's the reason for it. At the end of the day, like, Lamar Jackson was a restricted free agent last year. You know, like, who cares about the cap situation? Find a way to clear up some cap space and get Lamar Jackson on your team. Like, people make it seem like you got to try to find the best value, the best bargain at quarterback. Like, no, you don't. The NFL is a quarterback-driven league league like the only teams that really have gone far in the postseason despite not having an elite quarterback have been Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers but Arthur Smith obviously isn't the Kyle Shanahan like all of the best coaches in the National Football League or some of the best coaches that ever coached this game have had great quarterbacks you think of Bill Belichick Tom Brady Sean Payton Drew Brees Andy Reid Patrick Mahomes Donovan McNabb like he's no Patrick Mahomes but he was pretty solid Mike Tomlin, Ben Roethlisberger, Pete Carroll, Prime Russell Wilson, all of the NFL's best head coaches have great quarterbacks. Even think about your top five head coaches right now. They all have solid quarterbacks. The only head coach that can make things shake without not having great quarterback play or defensive-minded coaches because they don't specialize on that, on that side of the ball. But look at the Miko Ryans when they drafted C.J. Stroud. Imagine if Atlanta would have just said, you know what, yeah, we drafted Desmond Ritter last season, but we're just going to go ahead and draft another quarterback like the Titans did with Will Levis. You see, there were Falcons fans that told me, man, we can't draft another quarterback because we drafted Desmond Ritter in the third round. Who says you can't? Because Tennessee drafted two quarterbacks in back-to-back -back years, and Will Levis has panned out for them up to this point. You see, if Arthur Smith is going to last as the head coach for Atlanta, he can't go into the 2024 NFL season with below average or serviceable quarterback play. Like, Taylor Heineke is okay, but he's a stopgap quarterback. 
He's a good backup, low-end starter who can come in and be serviceable for you if your starter gets injured, but he's not somebody who can consistently win you games. Prime example, look at how the Arizona Cardinals game went. He got injured, Dazen Ritter came in and put them in position to win that game, and then, you know, Kyler Murray comes in and drives Arizona down the field with ease, and they end up winning that ball game. That's what happens when you have a franchise quarterback. When you have a franchise quarterback, you have a guy who you can trust in late game moments, somebody who's not going to sell the game. Desmond Ritter has folded for the Atlanta Falcons so many times this season with the game on the line. The dude is just too turnover prone, and the dude just doesn't see the field that well. So for Arthur Smith, if he is indeed coming back for one more season and 2024 is his prove a year, he needs to go out there and get him a damn quarterback. Deshaun Watson is out for the season. He's going to undergo season-ending surgery on a broken bone in his throwing shoulder. Now, the Brown season, is it over? I don't think so. Most people believe that it is. I heard Stephen A. Smith on first take not too long ago say that their season's over. They need to just go ahead and throw in the towel. I don't believe that because Deshaun Watson, it's not like this dude has played great football in the games that he started in for the Browns. Like his best two games so far up to this point with the Browns has been last week when he went 14 for 14 the second half and brought the Browns back against the Ravens. But the defense mostly did a lot of heavy lifting in that comeback. And then against the Tennessee Titans, outside of that, Deshaun Watson has been one of the worst quarterbacks in the NFL. Now, of course, having Deshaun Watson out there is better than having DTR or P.J. Walker out there. But with the way that this Browns team has been constructed this season, they probably won't be contenders to make it to the Super Bowl. But at least they can still find a way to make it into the playoffs. They got a really good team. Like their offensive line has dealt with some big injuries, especially at offensive tackle, but they still have demonstrated the ability to run the football. And the fact that they got some comfortable, com you know, some comfortable or however you want to put it, solid receivers on the outside like Amari Cooper and whatnot, this is still a team that is a threat to make it to the playoffs still. I mean, at this point, they're six and three. What else could go wrong for this team just to completely fall off the cliff? Because you look at their upcoming schedule. They play the Steelers, which I do believe is a winnable game despite not having Deshaun Watson. You lost to the Steelers with Deshaun Watson. He played awful in that game. Yeah, you're throwing out a rookie quarterback against a Steelers defense. That's really good. But C.J. Stroud tore this defense up. And with the way that the Browns win games, they were never winning games getting carried by elite quarterback play. They were winning games because of great defense and their ability to run the football. With how good this defense is and how effective Kevin Stefanski is at getting the most out of the run game, I at least think that they can find a way to win four more games and be a 10-win team and find a way to sneak into the postseason as a 7 seed. Because if Cleveland can win at least 10 games, then they're going to be in the playoff chase. All right? 10 games minimum is what you need to win to be eligible to even qualify for a spot in the postseason with how tightly contested the AFC has been. And the Browns aren't a quarterback-centric team. That's why I still have confidence that they can find a way to muster out a couple of victories. Hell, even when they had Jacoby Brissett last year, there's some people that may argue with the fact that if Jacoby Brissett would have played the whole entire season, the Browns would have had a better chance at making it to the playoffs Versus them forcing in Deshaun Watson because they paid him so much money. Now, when you think about the long-term implications of Deshaun Watson getting injured, this dude needs a new nickname because I think I'm going to have to call him Deshaun, Mr. Fragile Luggage Watson, because he's just an injury-prone player now. It's like you breathe on Deshaun Watson, he gets injured. You just put a finger on him, he gets injured. Even last week against the Cleveland, against the Baltimore Ravens, like the dude had effed up his ankle. He was playing through another nagging injury. Like one thing about Deshaun Watson, I'll give him credit for. This dude is one of the toughest quarterbacks in the National Football League. And people in the locker room really do like Deshaun. Believe it or not. He's one of the more likable quarterbacks in the National Football League amongst, you know, NFL players. I know it may seem hard to believe because of all the accusations that came out against him with the massage therapist and whatnot. And, you know, like, that definitely does make him have some questionable character. But most of the people who talk about Deshaun Watson when it comes to his teammates, 
They love the dude. You know, like, they go to war for Deshaun Watson. And him getting injured definitely is a big blow to the Browns, but it's not like this dude was all that great. Like, honestly, like, I don't think he's all that better than Kenny Pickett if we just being honest about it. So even though it seems like a big loss when you think about the name Deshaun Watson, I don't think it's a loss that just completely derails Cleveland season like how people like Stephen A. Smith are making it seem all is over. Like, they got no shot. Like, they got a chance, bro. Like, they go against the Steelers. And I'm a Steelers fan saying this, by the way. Like, I'm pretty sure the Browns can beat us even without Deshaun Watson. Like, our quarterback play hasn't been any better, and our offense isn't that good. Like, we're winning games the same way that the Browns are winning games, if we being honest about it. And, you know, you got to go on the road after you play Pittsburgh and play the Denver Broncos. And although the Broncos are playing really good football, your defense is good enough to keep you in that game. The Broncos' offense isn't going to be good enough just to put 20 points with ease on you. Then you got to play the Rams. Like, that's a winnable game. The Rams aren't that good. So there's a possibility that even if you do lose to the Steelers, you can at least go two out of three, maybe one or two at worst. You know, win seven games and still have a shot at making it into the playoffs. Then you got to play the Jags. Okay, like, that's a tough game to win. But then you got to play the Bears. The Texans are a winnable game, despite how well C.J. Stroud is playing. Like, they're not that good up front. And you got a really good defense. And then you got the Jets, who pretty much are the same version of you right now, but a lot worse. Like, I would take DTR and P.J. Walker over Zach Wilson in a heartbeat. And then you got the Bengals, which you might not have a chance to win that game. But essentially, I still see, like, one, two, three, four, five potential wins that the Browns could rattle off without Deshaun Watson. So I don't think all hope is lost. Okay, like, people look at the name Deshaun Watson and... You say, oh, it's Deshaun Watson. Like, they need Deshaun Watson to make it to the playoffs. No, they don't. Like, they beat the 49ers with P.J. Walker. The 49ers. People make it seem like Deshaun Watson was playing at an MVP level. Well, JT, like, without them, like, their chance of being able to win these games goes down. Like, of course it does. But it's not like even when Deshaun Watson was healthy, they had a chance to win these games compared to the chance that they have to win these games with DTR or P.J. Walker. I mean, your chances of winning these games were slightly better, but not all that better. Like, we just being honest, bro. Deshaun Watson has been one of the worst quarterbacks in the National Football League this year. If you were to rank quarterbacks in order from 1 to 32, Deshaun Watson probably should be somewhere around, like, the 24 to 32 range. At that, he hasn't been that good. So I don't think him getting injured this season just completely derails the Browns' playoff hopes. They got a great defense, a great rushing attack, and a pretty talented roster for any of these quarterbacks to work with. And you don't need great quarterback play to make it to the playoffs if you are the Cleveland Browns because of how talented of a team you have this season. Now, next season, you know, you're really going to need Deshaun Watson to play at a high level when you think about the long-term implications of this team because, I mean... It looks like you got fleeced by the Houston Texans. You trade away Deshaun Watson, all of a sudden they get C.J. Stroud, Tank Dell, Will Anderson, and it looks like they got a way more promising future than what you have. But his cap hit is so big that it's going to be hard for you to retain majority of your high-level players. The only players you're really going to be able to keep are probably Miles Garrett and maybe Amari Cooper. Then after that, you're going to have to go back to the well, try to piece together a competitive team and Deshaun Watson is going to have to carry you next season and hopefully he can bounce back to the level that he used to play at when he was with the Houston Texans but if we just being real about this this is probably the new Deshaun Watson the new Deshaun Watson probably is at best a top 15 quarterback we may not ever see Deshaun Watson get back to the level that he was playing at in his prime years with the Houston Texans and plus, with all these injuries that he's dealing with, they're probably starting to pile up, and they probably also have been a large reason why he's been unable to bounce back at that level. And it was kind of heartbreaking seeing him break down after the news came out with the injury and whatnot. Like, I know dude is kind of a shitty person, but, you know, like, I don't, I, I'm kind of rooting for bro to succeed despite the stuff that was going on with him and the masseuse therapist and whatnot. Like, it's just a weird situation, like. I don't hate Deshaun Watson. Like, a lot of people make it seem like, oh, you root for Deshaun Watson. You're a terrible person. Like, why can't I just root for the football player? You feel me? Like, if players in the locker room like Deshaun Watson, why is it, you know, crazy for me to kind of root for the dude to succeed? You feel me? Like, he does work hard. Like, this dude does grind, and players do like Deshaun. 
But, you know, next year with him having a cap hit of $63.9 million and that for the next couple of seasons, the Browns are really in a tight spot. And when you traded for Deshaun Watson, you thought that this dude was the missing piece of you being a Super Bowl contender. And now you look at the way Baker Mayfield has been playing with the Tempe Buccaneers. You kind of wish you had that right now. If you had Baker Mayfield the way that he's playing this season with Tampa Bay, you probably still are really good with your chances of being able to win the AFC North. Now, you still probably won't be able to make it far in the postseason, but even with Deshaun Watson, you weren't going to make it far in the postseason. But as far as Cleveland being able to keep their playoff hopes alive, at least for this year, they got a really good chance. Like, it doesn't matter if they don't have great quarterback play. I mean, the other teams they are playing against, they don't really have great quarterback play outside of the Broncos, the Rams with the healthy Matthew Stafford and the Jags, and the Bengals and the Texans. I mean, you can beat the Steelers. The Steelers are pretty much the same team as you, minus the quarterback like. We could probably say that Kenny Pickett is better than P.J. Walker and DTR because DTR hasn't really had a lot of experience. But, I mean, you can still win that game because their offense hasn't really been that competent. And then you look at the Texans, like, they don't really got a good offensive line, so that can be a defensive battle. And you should be able to run the football against that front. So I don't think that the season is over for the Cleveland Browns. I still think they got a lot to play for, and I still believe that they can stay in playoff contention despite this injury. You know... The Buffalo Bills firing offensive coordinator Ken Dorsey is a scapegoat move to me. I believe that Sean McDermott, his job security is definitely on the line. Joe Brady becoming their interim OC isn't going to change anything. Because here's the thing, right? You see, Sean McDermott is a defensive-minded coach. His job is to manage the defense, make sure the defense is up to par, and make sure that he hires the right guys to call plays on offense. And once Brian Dable left the building, like, this offense hasn't been the same. But at the same time, like, Josh Allen's turnover issues, I don't really think you can put that on the offensive coordinator. You can't control the offensive coordinator being able to limit turnovers when Josh Allen just naturally is a reckless player. That's always been his skill set. He's always been somebody that's been super talented, with crazy physical attributes, with a crazy strong arm and athleticism that allows him to get away with making certain throws that other quarterbacks will have no business being able to make. You see, Ben Roethlisberger, it never mattered who his OC was. Like, more times than not, he always was going to be one of those quarterbacks that always was going to rack up the turnovers and interceptions. That's just Josh Allen's skill set. He's a gunslinger. And when you have that gunslinger mentality, you're going to have a couple of costly interceptions that you're going to throw that people are going to get mad at you for saying, what the hell were you doing? What did you see on that play that even thought that even made you think it was good to throw that pass? But at the same time, though, like firing your offensive coordinator midseason, I don't think that's going to change the Bills fortune offensively, especially when you're going from You know, what you previously had in Ken Dorsey to Joe Brady. Joe Brady is still living off his momentum from that 2019 National Championship LSU team. And he didn't really call the plays all that much. All he did was just help with the passing game concepts. When he was the offensive coordinator full-time for Matt Rule with the Carolina Panthers, Matt Rule fired him on his day off. Now, you can say, well, he didn't really have too much to work with with what they had at quarterback, and now the fact that he's working with Josh Allen, a better quarterback, and a good team, like, he should be able to have much more success. I don't know, like, if this dude was a good OC, like, he probably would have been an offensive coordinator for somewhere else, rather that be in the professional ranks or the collegiate level. Joe Brady isn't going to fix the Bills' offense. Like, as a matter of fact, I think that this is, probably a key sign that things are starting to come to an end for Sean McDermott. Sean McDermott, if he gets fired at the end of this season, he probably will get another head coaching job. There's been plenty of good head coaches that have been fired and gotten second opportunities and have made it count. And I don't think Sean McDermott is a terrible head coach. It's just that, you know, with certain head coaches, they kind of run their course with a certain team. Sean McDermott, when he first got hired by the Buffalo Bills, This was an organization that had one of the longest playoff droughts in sports. You feel me? Gets them to the playoffs with Tyrod Taylor. He was a pro bowler under Sean McDermott in his first season. Then, you know, you kind of have that off year. You get Josh Allen. And then Josh Allen and company start to 
hit their stride. You get Stephon Diggs, and then you lose to Kansas City. Everybody talks about their overtime loss. And then after that Kansas City loss, it seemed like that was Buffalo's peak. Because after that, the Buffalo Bills have never been able to replicate that same amount of success that they had that season when they lost in overtime to Kansas City. And the main reason for that is because this team just has the ability to self-implode on themselves. They play down the competition and big games like Josh Allen does play pretty well. But the strange thing about Josh Allen is that he's better playing from behind than he is playing with a lead. You see, for the Buffalo Bills, like it seems like this offense only cares about getting the big plays. They don't care about being an efficient, methodical offense. And that does come down to coaching and the play calling. But at the same time, like, Kent Dorsey can't control how many turnovers Josh Allen has. Like, Josh Allen has to make better decisions with the football. I think turnovers kind of fall on the head coach. You're either coaching it or you're allowing it to happen. That's what they say. That's the old metaphor that they have for the turnover bug. Even Mike Tomlin. Like, Mike Tomlin's a really good head coach. But think about all the games that the Steelers have self-imploded on themselves because Big Ben was just a turnover machine. That's just the kind of player that Josh Allen is. And Brian Dable being the OC kind of was able to help mask that issue, but Josh Allen still was making reckless plays even when Brian Dable was the OC. Joe Brady isn't going to fix anything with the Bills offense. All he is is going to be a new face calling the plays, and I think that he kind of is a downgrade from Ken Dorsey. I'm not even going to say kind of like he's a major downgrade from Ken Dorsey. There's nothing that Ken Dorsey was able to do that Joe Brady is going to be able to do at a way higher level. Turnovers are a thing that I feel kind of falls on the head coach. And you got to tell your quarterback, hey, bro, like, stop being so damn reckless with the football. But you kind of can't because that's Josh Allen's skill set. Not just throwing the football, but look how the dude runs. Josh Allen isn't going to be playing football for the next decade plus with all the hits he takes and his style of play. He's just a tough-ass quarterback. And, you know, sometimes that's a reason why the Bills win, and sometimes it's a reason why the Bills lose. Regardless of who your next head coach is going to be, you got to find an offensive-minded head coach. And I think that Sean McDermott made that move to kind of save face. You listen to Josh Allen's post-game press conference when he was talking about the firing of Ken Dorsey. He really loved Ken Dorsey, and he said that as a team, we have to play better. We which still means that it still kind of falls on the coaching. And in big moments, Sean McDermott's defenses, they fall flat. Against Cincinnati, they got ran out of the building. Even before that, they couldn't even get a stop against the Kansas City Chiefs. Regardless of, you know, them not being able to get a possession in overtime, they should have been able to get a possession, cool. But at the same time, if you're a defensive-minded coach, your defense should be able to win you the game. Joe Brady has never proven on any level, both college and the NFL, to be a great offensive coordinator. He's living off the hype from 2019, and he didn't really have, well, he had a big impact, but the dude wasn't even a primary play caller. Joe Brady, he possibly could make things a lot worse than what they already are. Josh Allen is just a volatile player. That's just the kind of style of play he is. He's a gunslinger. He's kind of like Big Ben, but way more athletic. And with Big Ben... Even when he had good OCs, he was still pretty turnover prone with fumbles and interceptions and whatnot. So, yeah, you look at the interception numbers and you say, well, his turnover numbers have gone up since Brian Dibble left. Of course. Some of that has to do with the scheme and a good amount of that just kind of has to do with the player. A guy like Josh Allen, you kind of got to rein in. You kind of got to say, hey, man, like you kind of got to chill out with some of these throws. Like you got to pick and choose your spots a little bit more wisely. But sometimes you're just going to have a season when a great player like Josh Allen just kind of has a down year for his standards. Joe Joe Brady really isn't going to fix that. You see, the changes that the Bills need to make are with their head coach. You see, making a coordinator change in the middle of the season normally doesn't really fix anything because when you bring in a new OC in the middle of the season, the scheme isn't going to change. The problem with the Bills is the scheme. And Joe Brady isn't going to be able to bring in a new scheme and help these players get up to snuff with it in the span of a week. You can't do that, especially when you're about to get in the middle of the playoff chase, which the Bills are in right now. 
And they don't really know who they are offensively. They don't really have identity. Their identity kind of is Josh Allen, go out there and just play reckless and make plays for us. The Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis and Dalton Kincaid and we're running the football sometimes with James Cook when we're able to get it rolling. This is a cultural problem with the Buffalo Bills. I don't think it was just a offensive coordinator issue. I feel like, you know, Sean McDermott, kind of made that decision because he's now starting to feel the pressure. He's starting to feel that hot seat warming up because the Bills, over the last couple of years, the expectation has been Super Bowl or at least make it to the AFC Championship game. But this season, they may not even make it to the playoffs. I think that the decision to make Joe Brady, their interim OC and firing their offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey, was a huge mistake. And it was a scapegoat move for Sean McDermott to have a last ditch effort at trying to save face. This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us with a five-star review. You can find every episode of the podcast that's uploaded on the YouTube channel, Ideal Format, on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from. The JT Sports Podcast is available. I appreciate you guys for tuning in, and I'll see you guys with another episode shortly of the JT Sports Podcast.